Well, good evening, High Street family. We want to welcome you back to our evening services this evening. Uh, just a couple of announcements as we get going tonight uh, to make you aware of. Number one, if uh, you have not yet uh, gone to promote the hope.org backslash High Street Baptist Church and ordered your t shirt or long sleeve t shirt or hoodie um, for the youth camp fundraiser, you've got one more week to do that. Um, and that, that store will close um, next Sunday. Um, and if you have not ordered um, a shirt by then, uh, you won't be able to go back and order one afterwards. So make sure at some point during this week that you go um, and get your T-shirt or long sleeve T-shirt or hoodie um, ordered. And the proceeds for all of that, all the profit for that will go to our youth uh, camp uh, fundraiser and so uh, go ahead and do that as Jeremy said this morning uh, those will look great as we begin this summer to go do the gospel to every home and to take uh, the gospel to um, uh, all of the houses that we have been assigned that we can wear those t-shirts as we go out um, and they'll know that we are a part of High Street Baptist Church and they'll know that we are a family because it'll say it right on the shirt um, so uh, that is open for one more week. Um, also want to remind you about, um, what else do I need to remind you about? I didn't do the announcement this morning, so I don't remember um, exactly all of the things. Uh, reminder about our Wednesday night classes, th those are still ongoing. You still have time to, to get involved in one of those. And so uh, if you haven't yet come uh, for our Wednesday night discipleship classes, we're in module two and we'll begin our third week of module two. Uh, this Wednesday night, but there's still time for you to jump into one of those classes, and so uh, come be a part of that. All right. Um, Jeremy had mentioned something this morning about a meeting, um, but I don't remember the details of when that was. Do you? Next Sunday at 5, and that's for anybody who would be interested in uh, working in the children's department. Um, he didn't, and you don't uh, you don't have to uh, sign up on the spot. It's just kind of an informational thing. And so um, if you are interested in that, uh, you can come next Sunday evening, 5 o'clock, um, to meet with Brother Jeremy for that. All right. Um, if you have a Bible, let me invite you to grab it and turn with me to Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. When you find your place there, let me invite you to stand with us in honor of the God that we serve and His written word. Deuteronomy 32, beginning in verse 9, Moses writes to us these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But the Lord's portion is His people, Jacob His allotted heritage. He found Him in a desert land and in the howling waste of the wilderness. He encircled him, he cared for him, he kept him as the apple of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them, bearing them on its pinions. The Lord alone guided him, no foreign god was with him. He made him ride on the high places of the land, and he ate the produce of the field, and he suckled him with honey out of the rock, and oil out of the flinty rock curds from the herd and milk from the flock with fat of lambs, rams of bashan and goats with the very finest of the wheat, and you drank foaming wine made from the blood of the grape. This is the word of the Lord. Let us respond to it this evening by lifting our voices in song as we sing together. You may be seated as we sing, How Great Thou Art. Let's sing together. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power the universe display then sings my soul my savior god to thee 
How great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul. It is good to see everyone tonight and to greet you online who are watching from home or wherever you may be watching. As we come together tonight, I want to talk to you a little bit about the offering. And uh, this is a special opportunity for us to worship the Lord. And so I hope you'll take this opportunity to do so. Uh, this morning we read 2 Corinthians 9, 7, where the Apostle Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And so amen to that. If you would like to be a part of that giving tonight as you exit, you know that there are offering boxes and they are right by the back doors. You can just drop that in the top of the offering box. Or if you don't have anything with you tonight or you're viewing online, you can go to our website at highstreetsomerset.org and that's all spelled out. We hope you go there, click on the menu in top right hand corner and as that little sub menu pops down, you'll see Give. Click on that, follow the instructions, and you can make your secure one-time donation, or you can set up a reoccurring donation. You can always mail it in or drop it by Monday through Thursday, and we welcome you to do that. Uh, tonight, as we go to the Lord for our prayers, we had a number of praises. Today, we had just a beautiful crowd that came out, and I was so glad to see our Sky Hope ladies have finally been released to join us. And so they had a wonderful Sunday school, and then they were with us, 
And uh, just such a joy. You know, this Saturday, we're going to do 10 more baptisms. That'll be 30 of those girls who've come to know the Lord Jesus Christ just this year. And so we're so thankful to be able to host them and to be their disciple makers. And so I hope you'll get involved in those ministries. Also praising the Lord that uh, we have had a great prayer breakfast and we've been uh, planning on some new missions and ministries coming up and I want to encourage you to be a part of the 40 days of prayer and I looked at the table and my prayer books are still quite heavy in number so I want to really encourage you to grab one of those on your way out and pray each day it doesn't take but maybe three or four minutes to read through that day's prayer and to take that day's challenge. And I hope you'll do that. I'll talk a little bit more about that at the beginning of the sermon if time permits. And uh, don't forget about the third Monday of every month coming up March 15th. We're working with Hope Springs Ministry. And this is a beautiful ministry that Miss Brittany has helped us to dream. And she is connecting churches to the community much in the same way as PM59 does. And so her focus is on multi-housing units in particular. And so we're going to be at Harris Hills. And we'll be joining with some of our men and, and workers from uh, Maple Street First Baptist Church. So this is going to be an opportunity and a half. You really got to get on board and go out. You know, here's, what, here's how hard it's going to be. You just got to go be you. How hard is that? Just got to show up and be nice. Well, for some of you, that might be a little hard. But if you'll just pretend, we can get to no, I'm just kidding. Everybody just go out and be yourself. We, we need you. Uh, several prayer requests. I want to pray for the families who've lost loved ones, and they include the family of Steve Sutton and Debbie Russell and the family of Dale Troxtel. If you would remember these in your prayers. Also, praying for Miss Pam Hickman's husband, Joe Hickman. We talked about that this morning. She's a big supporter of Crown Missions and all that we do. She loves High Street Baptist Church, and her husband had complications due to a surgery. If you would add to your list the following, David Houghton, Daphne Sneed, Melinda Keith, Retta Ellington, Mike and Elaine Godby, Pat and Larry Weinstein, Wendy Bowie, Gary Akins, Norman Ard, Billy Norris, Dwayne Blackstock, Lisa, Mary, and Rebecca Coleman, and Mary Nelson, Hope Withers, Hazel Douglas, Eric Howell, and then, of course, all of the other missions and ministries of our church. Don't forget, Resurrection Sunday. We have a wonderful opportunity. We're going to have our photo booth set up, and you can bring your family and get a free portrait. And what a better time to do that. You're already going to be dressed up, and we want you to invite friends and family to come along with you. So we hope that you will make that accommodation and, and join us. And I just got word that Brother Alan Dodson is going to be able to join us this year for Good Friday services at 7 p.m., Friday before Easter. So I hope you'll join us for that as well. You may have an unspoken prayer request tonight. You want to indicate with the uplifted hand? And God knows that need. So let's bring our offerings and all of our prayer requests and our missions and ministries to the Lord tonight as we ask Him for His blessing. Father God, tonight we are very thankful that we can call out upon Your holy name. For God, you have gifted us with the ability to know you and to be known by you and to be saved by faith through grace in Jesus Christ our Lord. And Father, we worship you and we raise your name on high and we give you all glory and all power and all honor tonight. For you truly are worthy, God. Lord, as we have lifted up this offering before you. We ask you to bless it, to use it, to build up your kingdom here and all abroad, all around the world. God, we want to see the gospel reach the ends of the earth as you commanded us. And Lord, for each of these who have prayer requests, we know that you're already on the scene and that, Father, you're reaching in to each and every one of these lives, providing for them whatever their needs. And we give you the thanks in advance for them, Lord. Because we believe by faith that you're going to do that. Be with Shannon Amundsen tonight, Lord, as she prepares to share her testimony in just a moment. And give her the grace and the mercy that you've given her 
all the days of her life. And I thank you for that, God, in advance. And for all of these who have unspoken prayer requests, we lift them to you. All these things we bring to you by faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's continue to sing and worship together. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, darkness tries to hide, trembles at his voice. Trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. Don't oh, see how great, how great is our God. Age to age. The God had three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and oh, we'll see how great, how great. Father, we're thankful that we serve a God who is great. But it's not just that we serve a Father who is great, but we serve a Father who is intimate and is intimately involved in our lives. We serve a Father who is good and holy and just. We serve a Father who loves us unconditionally, above all else. So, Father, we're thankful that we can sing praise to the God of the universe, who is not just the God of all that there is, but you are our Father. And so, Father, we worship you this evening. We pray for the rest of our time tonight as we turn our attention to your word and we hear testimony. We pray that you would just continue to speak to our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And I just want to affirm what a great job Brother Brandon did this morning when he was talking to us about the biblical and theological reason that we sing. And I got a lot out of that. And I want to thank him. And, and if you got a lot out of that too, let's just give the Lord the praise tonight. It was wonderful. 
And I'm looking forward to that. Uh, tonight, we've been so blessed with testimonies, but tonight is my favorite one because this is my favorite human being on planet Earth. They say behind every good man is a better woman, and that is true. At least Daryl Burton told me I would have been gone long ago if it had not been for this woman. And so <laughs> Daryl didn't say that, but he thought it. Uh, <laughs> but I am so tickled to introduce my wife to you, and so I'm going to ask Miss Shannon to come. Uh, Shannon is just a wonderful teacher an incredible wife and pastor's wife, and a loving mom. So I'm going to turn it over to you, sweetie. Okay, that was great. <laughs> all right. Um, so first of all, if you know me at all, you know this is not my thing. <laughs> um, getting up here is not something that I would choose to do. As a matter of fact, when Ed asked me to do it yesterday, I said, no. <laughs> Immediately. No. Um, but then God worked on me all day yesterday, and I went to get Noah last night at work, and I called Ed from the car, and I said, I'll do it, because <laughs> God told me to. <laughs> um, okay, so um, I grew up unchurched. Um, I, f I felt like we were a pretty good family, did the right things, it seemed like. Um, I thought I was a pretty good girl, other than the occasional smarting off to my mom or, you know, that kind of stuff that uh, teenagers do. Um, and then, when I was about 17 or 18, I started going to church with a friend. And um, after a few years of sporadic attendance, I would go here and there when I could. Um, I received the Lord as my Savior. The day after I turned 21 years old, which I just realized when I was doing this that it was the day after I turned 21 years old. I don't know why I didn't connect all that. But anyway... Um, so I did that after realizing that I thought I was pretty good, but no one is good without Jesus. So when I came to that realization was when I received the Lord. Um, I was baptized on Valentine's Day in 1999, and you all know Silas was baptized on Valentine's Day this year. That's kind of special. <laughs> um, so fast forward a few months after that, um, I was attending Green Acres Baptist Church uh, where I was saved, and I had gotten my sister to start attending with me some um, she was kind of loosely attending, and she would go to some youth events. And the youth pastor at the time, even though I was a brand new believer, he allowed me to come and help. I mean, I guess I thought I was helping. Really, I was learning quite a bit, and I'm so glad that he allowed that because I know that that changed the traje trajectory of my life. Um, so uh, we would meet every Saturday, or not once a month, on Saturday nights, and there was this band that was coming. And the bass player would then get up and preach a message. So one particular Friday night, um, the youth was going to McDonald's after this event, and my sister begged me to go. And I said no. And she said, if you'll go, I'll go to Sunday school tomorrow morning. And she knew she had me because I had begged her to get in Sunday school, and she wouldn't. So I said, okay, all right, we'll go. So we went, and Ed was that bass playing pastor. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he was going to McDonald's too, and my sister was playing matchmaker. So, um, after some time after that, Ed and I started dating, um, and the entire time we were dating, I went from before I was saved to feeling like I was pretty good to feeling like I was incredibly not good enough to be dating a pastor or going to marry a pastor, you know, later once we had been dating for a while. Um, and Ed would repeatedly reassure me that no one's good, you know, no one's good enough, um, but we're good in Christ. Um, so after a year and a half of dating and engagement, we were married on June 2nd, 2001, but I was still a very young Christian. Um, I was still learning a lot about being a Christian, not the typical, what we think of as a pastor's wife, I guess. Um, and just as an example of that, when I was doing this, I got to thinking of, of examples of that. When we got married, we received quite a bit of money. You know, when you get married, you get some money. And I was blown away that we would have to tithe on that. I was like, seriously, we have to write a check that big for that? <laughs> um, so that just gives you an example. I was, I was just new to the faith and didn't understand everything yet. Um, a huge sticking point when we were early in our marriage was moving away from my family. Um, I struggled with that. Um, thankfully, our first 
ministry was only about an hour from my home, my parents. Um, but we kind of, we'd been there for a while and God started speaking to us and it seemed like our time there was coming to an end and we started interviewing at churches and one of them was in New York. So we flew to New York and it really seemed like maybe that's where we were going. And I can remember, actually it was on the flight home and Ed and I probably had one of the worst arguments that we've had in our marriage because I was fighting so hard against going anywhere further than I, ha I was away from home. So when we got home from New York, um, after determining that God wasn't calling us there, thankfully at the time I thought, Phew, thank you, um, Dr. Paul Chitwood, some of you know, contacted Ed about a church in Guam. And I was like, well, maybe New York doesn't sound so bad. <laughs> and then Somerset didn't sound so bad either. So we ended up here um, pretty quick after that. And, you know, maybe I wouldn't have been so good about coming if I hadn't have thought, this is three hours. That was, you know, what? I don't even know how far away that is. It's really far. Um, another aspect of my testimony is, as I said, I came from an unchurched home. My mom um, was saved at some point, but I didn't even know it. Like, we, it wasn't something that was discussed in my home. Um, but praise the Lord, we went from not any of us being in church. After I got in church, my whole family came when I was baptized, and that was a pretty big deal at the time. And then my stepfather got saved um, the Sunday before Noah was born, which was huge. Um, Ed said I put, he put him on the five-year plan, and it was just a little under five years, and he got saved. And then also Ed was able to lead several of my grandparents to the Lord, and that's just a blessing. Um, I feel like the Lord worked through my relationship with Ed to save my family. And that's huge. Um, and when I was practicing this, I didn't tear up there. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so I'm so thankful for that. But it wasn't until about six or seven years ago that I discovered my primary ministry, which is to women, and particularly women in crisis. Um, I didn't think I had much to offer because I didn't have a lot of common life circumstances with a lot of the women that seemed to come in my path, but it was when I was mentoring one particular young lady that I realized that she didn't need me to have those similar circumstances in my life. She didn't need me to have those experiences. Uh, she didn't need me to be wise or intelligent about what she was going through. She really didn't need me at all. She needed Jesus through me. Um, so, and, and also, don't mistake that in saying that that's my only ministry because I realize being a pastor's wife, it seems like God asks me to do all kinds of different things um, at any time, day or night. And some of those things are way out of my comfort zone, like standing right here right now. Um, but, you know, God gives us what we need. Uh, it doesn't matter if we feel qualified or not. We just have to obey what he tells us. So I want to encourage you, um, go ahead and think that you're unworthy because you are. And go ahead and think that you can't do this because you can't. And go ahead and think that you wouldn't know where to begin. Because when you put Jesus, when you put your faith in Jesus like I did, he will relate in any way that you can't. He will give you exactly what you need. Um, he'll be wise when you aren't. He'll be intelligent when you're not. And where you can't, and he only can, he will. And he will do it through you if you let him. And I want to read a verse, um, 1 Corinthians 1, actually a couple verses, 27 through 29. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no man may boast before him. And when I was thinking about um, my testimony, and I thought I needed to, I need to add a scripture, and I thought that was kind of perfect. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to think that people think I'm a pretty good person, <laughs> but in reality, I struggle every day, just like you all do, with temptation, and I fail daily. But praise God, Jesus won't fail me. I know that if I keep following Him, I'll become more like Him, and I give all all the glory to Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ for any good in my life. Y'all see why I'm such a blessed man. 
Amen. Um, let me just come back to this for just a moment. Um, prayer, I don't know if you know much or about prayer. I'm just going to assume that because you've been here, if you've been here any length of time and heard me preach, you're an expert. But at the same time, I don't want to assume that. Um, let me tell you about prayer from a little bit more personal standpoint. Um, throughout our marriage, one of the things that Shannon and I have done is prayed over everything. We've learned that if you run ahead of God, you're going to get in trouble. If you lag behind, you're going to get in trouble. So what you have to do is stay in constant prayer. And so we do. We stay in constant prayer. And we've seen God do miracles of provision, miracles of bringing people together. I mean, things that are just beyond the realm of coincidence. Um, I remember when we were just dating, uh, interviewing with her mother for a paper her mother was doing for her business class. And uh, when I came in, she said, how are you, Ed? I said, well, I'm doing fine, but I'm all out of gas. And she said, really? And I said, yeah, and I'm broke because payday's two weeks away. She said, how are you going to get home? I said, God will provide. And so she asked me a question, and I opened my Bible to a verse I was going to read her, and all at once, a, a $100 bill fell out of my, my Bible. And she said, no way. And I said, I did a wedding about a month and a half ago, and I forgot that was in there. She said, did God just provide for you? I said, well, I, I asked him in prayer on my way up here. And she said, no, that was coincidence. So throughout our marriage, we prayed. We were told we couldn't have kids, so we prayed. And we got other people praying. And then Noah came along, and we were, we were thankful, and we were rejoicing. And then, like, Six months later, we found out we were going to have another baby, and I went back before the church, and I said, Stop praying! <laughs> it's worked too well. Uh, we got two in a calendar year, so uh, God, God provided there. Just not long ago, uh, Shannon and I were sitting on the couch, and we were talking about a bill that we had to pay, and I don't even remember what it was, but it, it was something that we didn't have the money for. And, and she said, What are we going to do? And I said, Well, we're going to do what we always do. We're going to trust God. And she said, Well... I know, but what if you've not been faithful as a steward, then God's not obligated to bail you out. And I said, you're right, he is not. But he's a good God, and he realizes he's always bailing us out. So let's just pray and ask him. And she said, well, I just think that we ought to, you know, modify our life and do some things different. I said, yes, we should do that. I said, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pray that tomorrow at exactly this time, that there's going to be a check in the mail for exactly this much money. I don't know if it's going to come as a rebate of something or something we forgot about or whatever. And she said, I don't know. And I said, well, I'm praying it right now. And I did, and I prayed in Jesus' name. Next day I came home, and, and I was milling about and forgot about the mail. And about five minutes before the same time the previous night, I realized I didn't get the mail. I ran out to get the mail. I was going through the letters, and the last letter, I opened it up, and it said that we had overpaid a medical bill by the exact amount that we needed to pay the bill. And I walked in real proud like, you know, and I walked over to Shannon and she was sitting reading a book and she looked up at me and I dropped it in her lap and turned around and walked away. And she said, no, this is, no. And I said, yeah. So the ultimate example of prayer was Noah got his driver's license. And he tells me, he says, dad, I want the Murano. And I was like, that's my car. And I'm thinking, all right, I'll look on the internet and see how much cars are these days. It can't be that much. I mean, it's in a depression, a recession, or whatever you want to call this COVID thing. So I looked it up, and I found out, sure enough, I could afford a motor vehicle without the motor. That's about all I could afford. <laughs> Looking online, I was like, you got to be kidding me. People are paying this for cars now because I try to drive mine until the wheels fall off. I mean, I'll put a new engine in it before I'll buy a new car. So I realized I couldn't buy a car. So once again, I prayed. I said, God, you know I need a vehicle. And God, I want to give this to my son. He's going to be going to Bible college. He needs reliable transportation. I've kept this car in excellent shape. It will do him well. And so, Lord, please provide. And then, then I got to thinking, well, you know, our God is a, is a, he's a good God. I said, well, God, 
if you don't mind. Now, this is between you and you. Uh, but if you don't mind, I'd like to have a truck. But I'm not asking. I'm just point A, point B, God. That's all I need. But, but I'd love to have a truck. So I said, in Jesus' name, amen. And I went to Shannon and I said, honey, I just want you to know, tonight I prayed that God would provide me with a truck. And she thought I was ready to go car shopping. She was like, listen, we're trying to save up for a house. You can't go. I said, I know, I know, I know. I'm not saying I'm going to go buy a truck. I said, I prayed and asked God for a truck. She said, you just asked him to give it to you? Yeah. And she said, okay, I'm not sure, I'm not sure about that. And I said, he's provided so many other times. She goes, I know, but a, a car? I mean, isn't that a little? I said, well, I need it. We're, I'm going to give Noah this car. I'm without a car. And trust me, we can't afford a car like you just said. She said, okay. I said, but I prayed for a truck. And she goes, whatever. Two and a half weeks later, my sister calls me from Louisville, and she says, Ed, my half-brother, because we were the Brady Bunch, my parents got together, and, and so it's a long story. But anyway, she says, my half-brother in Ohio has gotten to the point where he has to move into a nursing home. He's not able to care for himself. And I'm his power of attorney. I have to liquidate his entire estate to provide money to pay the uh, nursing home because he's in a nice nursing home. We don't want him to go down into a not nice nursing home. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry, hon. Is there anything I can do? She said, as a matter of fact, yes. Yeah. She said, um, he bought this truck in the driveway. It's a 2010 Dodge truck with one of those bonus seats, but it's the smaller kind with a topper of all things. And she said, it's only got 27,000 miles on it. That's all he's driven it since 2010. And she said, and all he does is have the neighbor come over and start it twice a day. And he's been doing that for 10 years. She said, so I need to get rid of that truck. And I said, well, we just talked about this. I can't afford to buy a truck. She said, honey, I'm not asking you to buy it. I just want to give it to you. I said, Shannon. <laughs> and so my sister called me this weekend to say she went and picked up the truck in Ohio. And it's sitting in Louisville waiting for me. I, I want to tell you about prayer, not just from a from a, maybe a selfish or personal standpoint, but what I want to talk about is faith. We've got to have faith that we can get this gospel out. Not that we can, but that God can. And we've got to have faith that he's going to use us to go door to door and really see souls saved. I don't just want to put door hangers on people's doors, and I don't just want to talk to them about church or to have a nice day, or for them to say, I already believe in Jesus, and just drop it there. I really want us to engage people. But to do that, I think God wants us to pray. I think he wants us to pray believing. I mean, day two, uh, persisting in prayer, believing it before you receive it. God's going to do this, and so I need your help. I really, really, the kingdom needs your help. Grab one of these copies. And just take each day and pray believing because I think, no, I know for a fact that if we'll pray believing, the, I don't know if we're going to get the gospel to all 25,209 houses in Pulaski County, but I believe every single one high street members go to will get it. And that's what I really, really, really want us to do because we could see some real real life changing soul saving testimonies come from this so please pick up a copy and that's my spiel i'll shift gears i only have uh, just a few minutes but let's go back to deuteronomy chapter 32 and the message is entitled tonight god loves those he shoves I promised this today, and you thought, wow, this is kind of a contradiction. Normally, we're talking about how good God is, and, and suddenly, Brother Ed wants to say he's shoving us. Where does he get this? Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32, and as Brother Brandon was so kind to read, let's revisit those few verses, uh, beginning in verse 9. And, and let me just set this up. God's people... God's talking about how that he had divided up the nations of the earth and the inheritance of the men whom he has created was the land. And he had given them their land according to their borders. That was their inheritance. And he said that he uh, had 
given those nations their inheritance when he divided mankind and fixed the borders of the people according to the numbers of the sons of God. But the very next verse, beginning in verse 9, he says, but the Lord's portion, in other words, what the Lord gets out of this, what the Lord wants out of this inheritance situation, the Lord's portion is his people. God said man wants land, so I'll give him land. But what God wants is people. God wants people. And so when we hear that, that ought to warm our heart. And then he goes down in verse 11 and he says, Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them, bearing them on its pinions. We don't understand this much because I don't know about you all, but the only person I know in this, con- there's two people in this congregation who know anything about eagles. Number one is Isaac Morris because he worked at the Raptor Rescue Center, and so he knows about eagles. The only other one I know is Daryl, because Daryl photographs them. Um, But I don't even know if he would understand the full terminology here. So let's talk about this. Um, Do you know someone who has been deeply impacted by this pandemic? I want you to think about that. I know right now over in Jamestown is a widower, pastor friend of mine whose wife has passed away. And I was praying for her to live. And you know what? Sometimes God's answer to your prayer is no. And it was no. And they have young children. Maybe you're here tonight and you just feel like things are going wrong for you. You just feel like every time you seem to get situated, something comes along and upsets your apple cart and you're just kind of fed up with it. Or you want answers. Why does this happen to me? It doesn't seem to happen to anybody else. Loved ones, I've got some good news. God's either allowing this to happen to you. Say, how's that good news? Hold on. Or he's causing this to happen to you. Say, wait a minute, that's even worse news. No, it's good news. Could it be that God is actually wanting to disturb your life tonight? And here's why I say that. In our passage, God reveals that he's up to something because he said that he is acting like a mother eagle who stirs up her nest. Now, before you you get going too much, what is he talking about? Well, a mother eagle from day one, she lays this egg. And she covers that egg. And she protects that egg. She keeps that egg warm. She keeps predators away. She takes care of that egg to her own starvation. She watches over the egg. When the eaglet is finally hatched, This mother eagle will do everything for this eaglet. She will bathe it. She will keep it warm. She will go hunt food and bring it back and feed it. She will bring it water. She will care for it every so often. She'll pick some of her own feathers and line the nest with it so it's nice and comfortable and warm. She puts it way up high in the crags of the rock so nobody, nothing can disturb it. She does everything for this little eaglet until... Until it's time for this eaglet to learn how to fly. And when that happens, you have to look at it from this eaglet's perspective. All he's ever known is the warmth of the nest. All he's ever known is the fluff of the down feathers. All this little eaglet's ever known is whenever he's hungry, all he has to do is open his mouth and food magically appears. That he's safe, that he's secure from all alarms. Everything is coming up roses for this little eaglet. And then one day his mother starts flapping and fluttering and dancing and jumping. And she's beating her wings. You know, these wings have, a, have about a seven foot span and they're coming down. And, and he's getting beat to the left and to the right. And she's jumping around crazy. And he thinks to himself, my mother has gone off the deep end. And he realizes real quick... I'm going to die if I stay here with this flipping and flopping mama. And so what does he do? He jumps out of the nest without a parachute. Either that or mama finally gets a wing under him. She knocks him out of the nest. Now he's got big problems. (laughs) 
This poor little eaglet's fallen faster and faster up to terminal velocity over 70 miles per hour. He's getting up to 80 miles per hour, heading straight down to the craggy rocks below because mama never builds her nest anywhere but in the sides of those mountains or up in those trees. And so he's coming down, and he's seeing his life, his brief life flash before his eyes. How did this happen? Everything was warm. Everything was nice. There was food on demand, and, and, and I was warm and safe, and now I'm going to splat on on the rocks but that's not all the mother eagle she jumps down with the eaglet and she circles it as it falls and she's waiting to see is he going to look over at me and see how I'm doing this is he going to open his wings and catch the air or is he going to go plop on the rocks now now here's the interesting thing listen to this verse 11 like an eagle stirs its nest that flutters over its young spreading out its wings, catching them. So here's what happens. Scientists have watched this. It's, fun. it's fascinating. The, the eaglet is falling. If the mother knows it's getting too late and the eagle's not going to spread its wings, she will swoop beneath the eaglet so that the eaglet falls between her wings on her shoulders and she will fly that eaglet back up and drop him off in the nest. And you imagine that eagle, he's like, oh, thank God, I'm back to the nest. I never thought, oh, my gosh, what was that, Mom? And she'll let him rest a little bit, but guess what? She's going to do it again. And she'll do it over and over and over again until finally that eagle is saying, she must be trying to tell me something because this is the 101st time I've been kicked out of that nest and I'm getting tired of it and I don't want to do it anymore. And he looks over at her and sees her wings and he opens his wings and he flies for the first time. So you see, mama has a method to her madness now, let's apply it back to the scripture. So Moses is talking to the children of Israel. And he tells Israel that God is dealing with them by extension like a mother eagle to the eaglet. And, and so tonight we want to learn how God loves those he shoves and why he's shoving us sometimes. And the first thing we need to see is when we're feeling shoved, we need to recognize God's hand. Go back to verse 9. God says through Moses, but the land's portion of the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. The Lord's portion is his people. That's speaking about man's inheritance as land, but God's inheritance is people. God established the borders. He gave them lands, but God says, you are for me. And so we need to hear this by extension to us. God is saying, you belong to me. And if that's true, then you are God's portion, and that means that God cares for and loves you like that mother eagle loves her eaglet. And I want to remind you all that she did, but sometimes we think the devil is doing bad things to us. We, we think that the devil is, is doing things that actually the Lord may be responsible for. The Lord sometimes has to discipline us with a little bit of divine disturbance in our life. Now, keys unlock doors, and these certain scriptures unlock the meaning. Tonight, scripture teaches not all disturbances come into your life to crush you. Some disturbances are brought into your life to clear the path to the place God wants you to be. And we need to embrace this because God's not looking for nesting saints. That's not why he created us. When you ask most people what they want to do after college, you ask them, what do you want to do after technical school or trade school or, or when they get out of the military? Most of them will say, I'm really looking forward to settling down and raising a family. Think about that. 21st century Christians in America like to take it easy in life. We don't want any conflict we don't want any troubles. We don't want any challenges. On the contrary, God doesn't want us to settle down. And God doesn't want us to spend forever in this comfortable little cozy nest that he made for us as baby Christians. He has much bigger and better plans for us than just early retirement. 
So God de demonstrated his desire for us not to get too comfortable in the life of Job. Think about Job. Oh, poor Job. Before Job had his problems, he was wealthy. He was healthy. He had a whole lot of kids. He looked around him and he said, life is good. And, and listen what he said. Job 29, verses 18 and 19. I think you're going to find this to be very interesting. Job says, I thought, now he's talking back, back before his troubles, this is how he viewed life. He says, I thought, I shall die in my nest, and I shall multiply my days as a sand, my roots spread out to the waters, and dew all night on my branches. Job said, you know, when I thought about my life, I thought, I'm just going to live like that eaglet in the nest. I'm just going to enjoy the warmth, and, the, and I'm going to enjoy the softness, and I'm going to enjoy the finer things in life, and, and I'm just going to enjoy the endless food and the endless water and the protection from all my enemies, and it's just going to be great. In fact, I'm going to die here. I'm just going to stay in this nice hot tub for the rest of my life like us. Job wanted to retire before God really put him to work. That's a lot of us. We want to retire. We say, oh my, I'm already tired from work. I can't serve the Lord too. I mean, I work too hard, too many hours. But thankfully, God had another plan for Job. And I'm glad that he did because God loved Job. He shoved him right out of the nest that Job had built. And God used the discipline of divine disturbance on Job, even the things the devil did to Job. I want you to remember, he couldn't have done them unless the Lord permitted him. Because the devil has no power that God does not allow him to exercise. But why? Well, here's another key that unlocks a door. God is either going to be first place in your life or he has no place in your life. Do you, do, you, do you get that? God either gets first place or he has no place. There's no kind of God. There's no sort of. I'll listen to God in this area but not this area. I'll do things for God maybe here but not here. There's no kind of relationship with God. It's all in or it's all out. And I think we need to get into that and understand that because this should bring some, some comfort to us all tonight. Even behind the devil's torment of Job was this omniscient, omnipotent, providential power of Almighty God at work to love Job the way a mother eagle loves her child. See, God's not looking for nesting saints, and we shouldn't be looking for comfortable nests one preacher, one preacher who had a fine job and lots of security once prayed a very good prayer. I think we ought to pray, every Christian. Lord, if you ever see me trying to build a cozy nest, put a thorn in it. I don't want to get too comfortable that God can't use me. And I think that's the key for us all. To My friends, God loves you so much, he's not going to sit idly by and just change your name. He's not going to just give you the hope of a better life and each day just give you that hope. The funeral homes are filled with all of these dead bodies that they wash and then they put them in fine clothing and they paint their face to make them look alive and they paint their lips to, to make them look uh, full and healthy and thriving. But the problem is they put their hands in the natural resting place to make them look peaceful. But the problem is and the fact is the body is still dead. God doesn't want to change your hair. He doesn't want to change your face. He doesn't want to paint you up. He doesn't want to put you in fancy clothes. He doesn't want to call you something else. So oh, I'm a Christian now. God doesn't want to make dead men look alive. God wants to raise dead men back to life by faith in Jesus Christ. And so how does he do that? Well, I believe the largest, most powerful cult in America today is not Jehovah's Witnesses, it's not Mormons, it's not the Moonies or the Boonies or the Atheists. The biggest, most influential cult in America today is the cult of comfort. Someone once told me that my job as a pastor is to comfort the afflicted and afflict 
the comforted. You know what? I, I thought that for years, but that's a bunch of bunk. That's not the pastor's job. The pastor's job is to preach the infallible, inherent word of God and let the chips fall wherever they may. If the word of God comforts you, take heart. You have been comforted. If the word of God discomforts you, well, it's the word of God. It's doing its work. And if you're not disturbed at times, and if you're not challenged at times when you hear God's word, if you're not discomforted at times, or if you're not comforted at times, then you're spiritually dead and you need to be saved because you're without Christ. Some people would say, why can't God just leave me alone? Why does God need to use this discipline of divine disturbance? Why can't I just live a happy life? Why can't I just live to be a ripe old age? Uh, leave me alone, God. Let me die a quick and painless death and a peaceful death. How about that? Look where you were when God found you. Look at verse 10. He tells Israel, this is where you were when I found you. He found him in a desert land, and in a howling waste of the wilderness, he encircled him. And then he cared for him, and he kept him as the apple of his eye. The reason why God won't just leave you alone, quote unquote, is because you're not in a happy place. You think it's a happy place because all you've ever known is the desert. All you've ever known is the scrub brush. All you've ever known is the lack of water and the beating down heat and the thirst and the dead bones that are bleached all around you. That's all you've ever known. You say, God, I just want you to leave me alone in this dry wasteland of a desert because I like it here. And God says, he's circling around you. He says, you have no idea, do you? You have no idea what I have for you just over that next ridge. A land flowing with milk and honey, grasses and birds and trees and a beautiful breeze and water to drink and, and friends to love. No, I'm not going to leave you here just because you tell me you're happy in the wasteland. So the answer to your question is found in the mother eagle stirring up the nest and shoving her eaglet out. Eagles weren't created to sit. They were created to soar. And loved one, the Lord is so much more for you than just a little white house and two cars and two and a half children and a 401k program and dental benefits. He's got more for you than that. Comfortable nests do nothing more once they've raised the child then confine us and constrain us. Let me tell you this. Comfortable churches do the same thing. Comfortable churches that just welcome you to come in, sit down, enjoy, be catered to, not going to ask you to do anything, don't want you to get upset, don't want you to get tore up. We're just going to pamper you and play the music you like. We're just going to lull you to sleep with our sermons and tell you how great you are and how you just don't need to change a thing. Listen, God says, get out of the nest. That's not where I want you to be. Dr. Theodore Coiler wrote these words. God sees that you and I are at all the time determined to nestle down among our creature comforts. We build these earthly nests for ourselves and we fix our affection on them. And then we settle down in them. Just, just look back at what we've been reading and read the scripture this past week. We've been talking about, um, what, the two and a half tribes, uh, Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh. And they come and they, they dispossess Og and Sihon of their lands, the Amorite kings. And, and they divided up the spoil and suddenly these men who, who had a few flocks and herds, now there's, there's hundreds of thousands of, of sheep and hundreds of thousands of donkeys and hundreds of thousands of camels and oil and, and there are fields ripe for the harvest and they look out and they go, hey, this land looks pretty good for taking care of sheep and suddenly we have sheep. And they go to Moses and they say, Moses, we don't want what God has for us. That old promised land, we just want to stay right here. 
And you know what? Here's the sad thing. If you read the story to its conclusion, you know they paid the price. They had to go in and fight with their brothers to help overtake the promised land, but they missed the prize. And so many of us do that. We pay the price or we refuse to pay the price and we miss God's prize of the promised land. Do you want to settle for what you can do? Go ahead for the white fence and the in the house and the 2.5 kids and I promise you this you get your 401k and you get yourself all set up just like you like it put on only the music you like to hear read only the books you like to read and I promise you this within six minutes you'll be miserable because that's not what you were created for do you want to fully receive all that God can do in your life and show you things beyond your ability to imagine? Well, God says, I've made you for a lot more, so I'm going to kick you out of the nest. Why pay $200 for a box of crackers when God's offering the ribeye and the baked potato and the salad for free? Man, take what's behind door number two with God. Eagles weren't created to live in fear. They were created to be fierce. And I also want you to know something else. Eagles weren't created to sit. They were created to soar. They weren't created for fear. They were created to be fierce. And eagles were not created to be featherless. And they're not created to act featherless. And even if they did act featherless, people would look at you and say, what's your problem? You're covered in feathers, but you're acting featherless. A lot of Christians are acting like featherless eagles who have feathers. And that's the thing about Mama Eagle. She shoves that eaglet right out of the nest. Baptist preacher named George Truitt said it best. You were not made to grovel in the dust. You were made for high hills. You were made for the vast firmament. You are not muckrakers. You are not to wallow, grovel, and grope like the beast of the field or of the stall. You were made to fly And the very meaning of every event, every task, every experience, every cloud, and every struggle is to teach you to fly. So God has to bring you trouble. You look at the church in Acts, chapters 2, verse through 7. Everything was going good. The Bible said they added 3,000 one day, and then they started adding more. They were meeting in houses day to day, eating their bread. Everybody shared everything they had. It was all good. You know, that's the last time the church was ever in peace. Because <laughs> what happened next? A little trouble started. In the church, no less, two little old ladies start fighting now over who got more food or who was getting more attention. And so that's when the deacons were born. And I'm not saying that's when all the problems started, Joe. I'm just saying it's coincidence. Nonetheless, no, deacons are great. Uh, but, but, but the church, suddenly there was, a, a, there was a great persecution that broke out. And Christians surely believe this has to be of the devil. Who would persecute the church and cause us to feel like we need to run away? Why would, why would God allow the devil to do that? But when you read on in the Bible, you realize those people who ran away from the persecution who are Christians, yeah, they went out into Europe and they went out into Asia and they made churches there. And High Street Baptist Church wouldn't sit at the corner of 102 Bourne Avenue today if God didn't kick some eaglets out of the nest back in the early church. Recognize God's hand. And then I'll conclude with this. Respond. To God's hand. Look at verse 12. The Lord alone guided him. No foreign God was with him. I want you to look and see what God intends. He intends to guide you. He wants you to put away all your other idols, all the other things that you think are so important in your life. He wants you to just set them aside and for once in your life say, God, I want you to be the sole guide in my life. Let's do it your way for a change. And God is making a commitment to lead you and I. So we need to make a commitment to follow where he's willing to lead. When the eaglet took its eyes off its own failure and its falling and put its eyes on its mother and saw what she was doing, he learned how to open his wings by faith and fly. 
That's like faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us we have all fallen short. And the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Look to Jesus Christ and live. I want to conclude with Deuteronomy verses 13 and 14 of chapter 32, verses 13 and 14. It says this. He made him ride on the high places of the land. He ate the produce of the field and he suckled him with honey out of the rock and the oil out of the flinty rock, curds from the herd and milk from the flock with fat of the lambs, rams of Bashan and goats with the very finest of the wheat and drank foaming wine made from the blood of the grape. How many blessings has God given to us? How many blessings does he want to give to us if we'll just respond to him by faith? He's inviting us tonight to trust in Jesus Christ and be saved. You can jump out of that nest tonight and say, Father, I'm going to trust Jesus. I can't predict this life anyway, so I'm going to go with a better God than me. I'm going to trust Jesus Christ. I'm going to put my faith in him tonight as Savior and Lord of my life. I'm going to Geronimo out of this place I'm standing. I'm going to fly freely in faith in the Lord. Loved ones, if you learn nothing from this lesson, God loves you enough to let you jump and come to faith in Jesus Christ. He also loves you enough to shove. So what will it be? Will you jump by faith? (laughs) Or are you going to have to fall a few times? I recommend you go the first time. Tonight, if you're ready to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you simply call on the name of the Lord. God, I know that you sent your own son, Jesus Christ, like that mother eagle who flew down next to that falling baby, waiting to catch it in between her shoulder blades and soar up on high. Would you put your faith tonight like a falling eaglet whose only hope is that mama eagle? I hope she gets beneath me, and then she does. Jesus will get beneath you tonight, and he'll raise you up. If you'll put your faith in him, he went to the cross for you. He's a sinless man. He didn't deserve to go to the cross. The cross is a place for thieves and murderers. But yet he, an innocent man, went to the cross. Why? To die in your place. God did not want any of his children to die. More importantly, not to experience eternal separation from God in a place called hell and punishment and flames and fire, misery. God doesn't want that for you. And so he came himself to take the punishment for you, to take your sin and be punished by the wrath of God, to die on the cross and on the third day raise again, so that all that you would have to do is simply say, Lord, I call on your name as Savior and Lord of my life. And I believe by faith God raised you from the dead, and I'm going to follow you. Would you do that tonight? Maybe you're here and you're looking for a church home. We're ready to receive you. The question is, are you just going to sit in the nest, or are you going to step out and come forward? Maybe you need prayer. Things in your life aren't going great. You heard the message, still didn't cheer you up. May not going to cheer you up, but what could you do? And jump out of the nest, come forward, and let us pray with you. Maybe you're called to ministry, some form of missions or ministry. Once again, you're going to sit in the nest until God shoves you out? Or are you going to say, you know what? I'm going to jump and take that step tonight and trust God. Whatever it is you need, I want to invite you to come to this altar. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to guide us. Lord, tonight we come before you. You've heard the songs of worship today, and we have sung them to you. Lord, you have heard our hearts. You've heard the testimony. Lord, you've heard the scripture being read and heard and understood. You've heard the preaching, and they've heard the preaching. And now, Holy Spirit, come and have your way among us. Lord, I pray many people would step out from where it's comfortable 
and take that faith step by trusting in Jesus Christ or joining the church. But Lord, even still, if some would resist, I pray that you would shove them. Because either way, God, they need to come your way because your way is life. So Lord, let them put their faith in Jesus Christ. If they're already born again, let them put their faith in Jesus Christ. They have been called to missions and ministry. Let them put their faith in Jesus Christ. Whatever it is, God, let them respond tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So stand with me. This is the time for you to make the decision to step out of the nest and come forward. You come as we sing. Out of my bondage, sorrow, and I, Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come into thy freedom, gladness, and life. Jesus, I come to thee. Out of my sickness into thy health, out of my want and into thy wealth, out of my sin and into thyself, Jesus, I come to thee. Out of my shameful fear.